So hello everyone, so welcome to our this week Progressive PGA seminar. And today we are glad to have the Professor Dong Kuan Xu from the NC State University give us this talk. And uh, Dr. Xu is currently assistant professor in the CS department, NCSU, and leads the NCSU Reliable and Efficient Computing Lab. His research interests are in reliable, efficient, and landable deep learning for AI at scale, uh, and investigating how to achieve Pareto optimality between the performance reliability, computational resources, and the model performance of the deep learning systems. And uh, uh, Dr. Xu's research has been published repeatedly in top conferences and journals in AI, natural language processing, and other fields. He served as the column editor for ACM SIG AI newsletter and the chairs the first workshop on deep learning hardware co-design for AI acceleration. He has served the session chairs for new deep learning architecture for scalable and trustful AI at the KDD and uh, served as uh, senior PC members and regular role for many, many ACM conferences and journals. And he also launched the machine learning algorithm and the NLP community. And uh, he has extensive research experience in industry, collaborated with many uh, companies like Microsoft, uh, Morphit AI, and the NEC Lab, and so on. So now let's welcome uh, Professor Xu to give us this talk. Thank you, Dr. Yuan. Um, so hello, everyone. And um, this is DK. And uh, so I'm from the CS department of North Carolina State University. And uh, so today I will um, talk about the uh, our recent research efforts focused on the, the trade-off between the efficiency and the reliability. So my talk today is um, the test accuracy is not all you need. Uh, we also prefer um, the less cost and more reliability. And my talk will have two, uh, will have four parts. Uh, we'll first spend some the, the the time on the smart training, then talk about the reliability and in the especially in the uncertainty the domain. Then after that, I will um, share with our recent efforts. Why is focused on why is focused on the uh, how to generate the the reliable the smart models um, on the in distribution data, and the last one would be the how to generate the reliable model or sparse model on the out of distribution data. Uh, first, some background. So uh, I think um, everybody should be very familiar with this figure, kind of figure. So um, in the past decades, people uh, prefer using the larger and the larger the, the models to achieve the, 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 the incredible, the crazy, and uh, the good performance across the various uh, tasks. And so, for example, like the GPT series. So more recently, people are very crazy about the chat GPT and also like the the birds like the switch C, uh, which is more than 1.6 trillion. And so however, so we found that the in the real world, the resource computation resource is kind of limited. So you cannot say that uh, I have all these kind of large models I can use for everywhere, for any cases I'm interested. No, that's impossible. So for example, like your like your mobile phone or smart uh, like the smart watches. So it's kind of limited. So um so this can this mean that in the uh, in many uh, case in the many real cases we cannot uh, directly utilize the enjoying the benefits of the increase in the large AI or the big models. So as a result, uh, the model compression is kind of uh, desirable. So which uh, whose goal or which the goal is to um, compress the model size while achieving a similar performance. Um, so bring, uh, introducing the sparsity uh, is one of the popular and uh, the, the compression approaches. Um, uh, people always talk about the pruning. Yeah, pruning is quite uh, well known. So pruning, the main um, a part of pruning is to remove some collections, uh, especially some of the, the trainable parameters in your deep learning models, which can reduce the, the storage requirements. Um, uh, however, and the no in contrast, um, pruning main focus on the inference stage. So we, if we want to deploy a kind of the a smaller model into some of the uh, memory limited devices, we we aims to use the pruning as approach to reduce the requirements. 
Um, but in this talk, uh, I will mainly focus on the sparse training. And sparse training in comparison, uh, and many focus on the, the, the training stage. So, so this is kind of very, how to say, the, it's kind of trending. So um, the AI model, the larger AI model is kind of default setting or default choices for you. So uh, when we, we really want to update or uh, keep training this kind of the, the big checkpoints on different domains. So this will have, uh, th this will require some the some training, for example, on your lo locally or on some of the, some, um, so the smart training can bring some of the benefits. If, for example, it can save the training, the, the training, the, the cost, it can also because its outputs is some of the kind of a sparse model. So it can also benefit the inference. And the typical, the general, uh, the, the general idea of sparse training is that it will first initialize the sparse model and then it will update the, the associated sparse mask, sparse mask. Uh, finally, we can generate a desirable sparse model. So, and for, but for the typical training, we always keep all the parameters in the, for example, in the GPU, we will try to uh, optimize all the parameters uh, for each batch, for each, for each iteration. So that's the difference from, that's the difference between the sparse training and the, the standard, the, uh, the, the dense training. So this figure describes the uh, more details about the training pipeline. So um, I, I want to have your attention because this will play some of the, will lie some of the foundations for my talk. So we will start from the left. So this is kind of initialized model. The circle here, the circles here indicates the neurons and the line indicates the collections, also the, the parameters. So uh, we initialize the sparse one. The sparse model means that some of collections are, and there are not some of the collection between some of the neurons. And so it, we're first going to the exploring stage. The exploring stage is, ten, is kind of typical training. So we will, based on the, based on the loss function, we will train the, the parameter associated with these collections. After a certain of, uh, iterations, we will do the prune and the, uh, the growth stage. Um, there are some of the pink links. Uh, this time, the, 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 the collections will be removed during this stage. And there are some of the green links. Uh, these links are some of the, the, the new links, new collections will, will be grown in this stage. So, so this, this four, for example, here, these two, uh, the pink collections uh, originally uh, existed. However, based on some of the criteria, we want to remove them. For example, maybe their maximum value is not that high. So we improve them, but at the same time, in order to keep the sparsity, we want to um, select from some other uh, collections and choose some of them to to fix the the gap of the sparsity. So we will we will uh, choose according to some criteria. We will choose some other collections and the, grow them. And uh, so similar, we, we, after that, we will go to another the exploring stage, do some of the training, the typical training. Then we will do the prune and the grow again, and again. And finally, you can see at the the left uh, at the left button, uh, we will have our desirable the sparse model. So this model is you can see some of the pink. All these pink collections are the collections that we have explored, and the blue ones, the four blue uh, collections, are the final collections we we desire to have. So. In summary, uh, the sparse training, uh, the input is an initialized sparse model. The output is uh, the desirable sparse model we, we want to have. Um, but there could be some different strategy. For example, you can, some people can uh, start with the sparse model with lower sparsity and increasingly uh, and gradually increasing, uh, increase the sparsity. It's okay. So, but the general pipeline, it's, it's the same. So before going to, and some more uh, technical parts, or uh, I want to allow the people, the audience from and uh, the uh, maybe who are not from the the the, the sparsity domain, so uh, to uh, to let them know more the the backgrounds. So when we talk about the sparsity, we will have this. We will have always design or keep maybe the masks. So it's called the it's called the the sparse mask. So it's very simple. It's just the binary the matrix. So some the elements is either zero or one. The the zero elements indicates the corresponding, the collection is inactive. 
The elements one indicates the corresponding neuron or collection is active. Active means that that collections will be involved in the updating or the optimization for each iteration. Zero means that it will not be updated during the optimization at, that, at, at one iteration. And generally speaking, uh, there could be two kinds of masks. One is the structure mask, the other is unstructured. So the structure is kind of the, the zero, the elements zero, the distribution is kind of some of the pattern. For example, in this figure, you can see uh, there are some of the rows, some of the pattern, or in the middle one, there could be some of the block pattern. And so the advantage of the structure is that it's more friendly to the hardware system. And in comparison, the unstructured sparsity and the sparse mask is shown in the most right. So we can see, and the, there is no uh, very clear distribution pattern for the, for the mask. So um, the, the benefits of the unstructured is that it's more flexible and it's more and you ratio of better performance. Um, so let me give you more the detailed example of the sparse training. And so generally, for example, we aims to uh, have a, we aims to generate the ninety percent sparsity sparse model. Um, so first step, we initialize a sparse model, and ten percent of the parameter will be active. Uh, however, ninety percent of parameter will be inactive. Second, we will train uh, like the delta t iterations for this kind of initialized model, and all the inactive weights will be fixed, will not be involved in optimization. Step three, after the step two, we will check some, we will check the importance of the weights again. We will prune some of the active weights by criteria. At the same time, we will regrowth some inactive weights by criteria B. Then we will check the stopping criteria. If, me, if met, we'll stop. If not, we'll go back to stop at step P. So uh, again, iteratively training and iteratively pruning, iteratively regrowing. So that is the spot training pipeline. Um, so there are uh, some of the best, there are some of the existing efforts, um, two representative works. One is called the Regal. Uh, Regal is called the rigging the lottery tickets, making all tickets winners. So, it's very simple, the idea. It's just to introduce the lottery tickets hypothesis into the training part. So it wants to keep or finding or determine the lottery tickets in the for the training stage. Um, the BSRNet is another representative of the sparse training methods. The authors introduced some of the prior and distribution assumption for the sparsity pattern. So they use, use some of the sampling approach or and to, for example, some of the prior maybe benefits the robustness. So that is the another representative uh, effort. So, um, however, and there is a key question that um, because in the real world we could, um, many of the real world cases are ignored by people. For example, how uh, the distribution shift or some of the some of the, the data is quite limited or blah blah. So how to deploy the a sparse model in the real world is kind of uh, is kind of challenging. The key question is that uh, how reliable uh, the sparse model generated by your methods would be. So that is the the background of the sparse training. Um, any questions until now? Uh, yeah, I have a quick question. So when you regrow the connection, like how which kind of uh, initialization? Do you use? Do you take uh, into account the auto weight, or you just randomly initialize them to to train? Oh, so in our uh, in our uh, efforts, we uh, keep the we keep the value from the from the previous stage and keep the value of keep the output value from previous stage. But you could do uh, this is a good question. You could do the the randomly initialization again. Um, but I should say the typical one would be keep the keeping the previous one. All right, thank you. Yeah. No problem. Okay. Uh, hello, Professor. Uh, oh, yes, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned there uh, in the training of, uh, in the sports training, there is there are a series of uh, uh, pruning and growing. It's some kind of like uh, actions in the uh, reinforcement learning. Is there any work do this by reinforcement learning? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, thank you for a question. You are, I think you are very familiar with, with reinforcement learning. That's true. So the key 
And uh, maybe some of the key technique about the pruning and the uh, growing is kind of very similar to the, the idea of reinforced learning, like exploration and exploitation. So um, uh, I think uh, there, um, according to my uh, current understanding, there is no existing efforts directly applying the reinforced learning idea into the, the sparse training. But in our work, we discuss some of the parts. Um, but I'm not, I'm not very sure that currently uh, this year, 2020 and uh, uh, 2023, if there are any uh, efforts, you can check it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's very similar. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think uh, one of my collaborators is uh, exploring this idea and the, the publish, uh, we recently got the publish, um, uh, called by publish in, in DAC 2023. Yeah. So um, if you can check the, so you, uh, afterwards you can check my homepage, you will find more information about that one. Uh, sure. Thank you. No problem. Hi, Professor. I have uh, uh, tried some sparse training code, but uh, it seems uh, the training uh, uh, speed uh, is very, uh, very uh, not uh, overrace. Oh, overrace? What do you mean? Uh, it's uh, uh, still very, um, uh, very uh, training, very slow. Uh, even oh. you use the sparse training method. Yeah, so your question is that, uh, what's your question? Your question is that, is it true, uh, your question is that the, the sparse training is always slow? Uh, um, I, um, the uh, sounds, uh, sparse training method uh, seems not uh, uh, save the training and infants uh, uh, speed, uh, yeah. Yeah, you're correct, I should say. So I think you are very smart about this idea. So. Uh, basically saying that the, the sparse training, the principle is that using uh, the time and to save uh, the, the space. So because the you can see during the sparse training, we we'll always do some exploration. So this will require a lot of efforts, some trials, some error, some failures, some stuff could be success. success. So that's true. And uh, we recently also have one submission. Um, so how to speed up the sparse training of why and correcting the gradient estimation um, for each uh, for each um, pruning and growing stage. I think you can find that one in my in my Google Scholar uh, homepage. Um, but I, I I believe there could be other ways to to speed up the sparse training. That is only one very primary um, the exploring work. Yeah. Does does my answer um, make sense? Okay, uh, if there is no other question, I will continue. So I will just save the time. So uh, I don't want to waste your time. <laughs> so uh, I will talk about the reliability in uncertainty. And so uh, this is the, some of the idea from the Google. So Google and um, they um, design and propose some of the re reliability framework for the deep learning system. So reliability is quite important, especially for example, like ChatGPT. Everybody talk about ChatGPT, but how reliable it, it would be? So if it is not reliable, can you use it? Or can you take the risk uh, to, uh, of using it? So it's hard to say. So reliability is kind of critical. And so uh, reliability can be, have, uh, be involved in three parts, uncertainty, robust generalization, and adaptation. So in this talk, uh, I will mainly focus on the uncertainty in terms of the reliab reliability and uncertainty. Um, but we also have some of the un -pro uh, in process, uh, ongoing pr uh, projects about the um, exploring the efficiency and the robust generalization, and exploring the efficiency and, and adaptation. And you can check more results on my homepage. And we, I think uh, once we have some significant efforts, we will release them. So in this talk, we will focus on the uncertainty. Uh, what is uncertainty? So let me give you two uh, illustrations. So um, this is the, uh, we can talk about the classification task. We can also talk about the regression task. So for this, for example, on the top right, this is the fig two sub figures for the classification, classification, classification task. And so the task is to, we have two class, class A and class B. Uh, this is the kind of the boundary, decision boundary. And on the right, the, the X is the confidence score. So it means that's how confident your model is about its prediction about one instance. And the, the, the Y axis is the sample, number of samples. So, uh, you can see there are two there. Are, um, 
So the uncertainty is kind of, you can consider uncertainty as the area in the middle. So that is the overlap between these two main, that is the overlap between these two main distributions. So that is to say, if the, the class A and the class B, the distribution is fat and overlaps more, so the uncertainty will be higher. So that is uncertainty about the, for the classification task. So it means that the, the value means that the absolute value is higher, the model is will be more confident. So it means that if the, it's more close to zero, so the, 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 the model is not, is not sure about the prediction. Uh, on the on the on the uh, on the top on the bottom, this is the figure for the regression. The regression, the x is the inputs, and y is the outputs. You can see there are some dots. So the goal is to generate the line which can be fitted into the to the these dots. So the uncertainty actually uh, is represented by the 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 shadow range. So the shadow range typically you can you can use the two the 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 two times two times standard deviation to describe the uncertainty. So if the, the range is higher, it means that at this point, at this, at the, at this area, uh, the model is, is more, is, uh, the uncertainty is higher. So that is uncertainty. So for example here, but there is a question. So for example, if we our goal is to classify a dog or cat. So if the model will can generate the two, uh, we'll give it the two probability, the P1, P2, if P1 is higher than P2, uh, we believe it is cat. If P1 is smaller than P2, we believe it is a dog. But how about the two opts, outputs? One is 0 point line, 0 0.1 versus a 0 point, um, point 0.6 and 0.4. So for both, of, uh, for both of the predictions, we should say that uh, it is a cat. But it seems you can clearly observe that the model will have different confidence about the predictions. So it means that the same uh, we could have the same predictions, but the model could have different confidence. So this is uncertainty. So uncertainty reflects the model's level of confidence in its predictions. Okay, so we talk about uncertainty. What is reliability? So reliability in uncertainty come can we 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 continue to use the previous example. So we have the two outputs. One is the a point line point one, and the other is point six point four. So it, if we assume the model is correct, the model is well is well trained. We should say, oh, and the first one is model. The model is more confident about the first output, and the prediction is more accurate. Okay, the model the prediction is accurate. However, if the if the for the point, point six and point four, we should say, oh, the model is not that confident. The prediction might be wrong. Okay, so this is the the model's behavior, the model's feeling. Okay, so there described the, the description can be illustrated in the, the right figure. So this is logic, this kind of co corresponding to the cat because this one is absolutely higher. So the model is very confident in the cat. But for this one, you can see some of the distribution is not is kind of uniform. So it's hard to say. Okay, um, so in the real cases, in the real world cases, we always encounter the, the two uh, kind of data. One is the in distribution, the other is out of distribution. In distribution means that when you do the evaluation or when you do the testing, the data could be sampled from the training data distribution. But out of distribution means that the evaluation data could be sampled from some of the out of the training data distribution. So for different, for these two cases, we will have different definition or have different reliability for each of them. For example, for the in D, the in distribution, we want the confidence equal to the accuracy. What does it mean? So it means that if the if the uh, if the we have the two if we have the the point line point one this kind of prediction, we should um, so this is the output from the model. So we also expectedly that the the ground truth should also be correct because the model's prediction is is that it is that it is a dog, so it is cat. Or we, the ground truth should also be the, it is a cat, but for the the lower confidence, the 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.4, so the model is not very confident. So it allows there could be some the error. So it allows maybe the the ACC is not that high. So for it means that for high confidence of the model, we should have a higher we should have a correspondingly higher accuracy. For the lower confidence prediction, 
we should assume that would be lower, the Q could be lower the, the accuracy. So I mean, so other results, the confidence should be should match the, the distribution of the accuracy. So that is the definition of reliability for the in-distribution data. However, for the out of the distribution data, it's kind of different. For the out of the distribution, we first need to determine or allow the model to, 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 to say, oh, maybe this model, this sample is not from the, 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 the in distribution. If, if that happens, we, the model, we should allow the model to say, I refuse to make the prediction. I refuse to make a decision. So after that, we can do, so if the model say, oh, it's out of distribution, so the model will, some of the human will be involved in the decision loop. But if the, we, if the model determine oh, it is the in-distribution data, we just follow the, the in-distribution strategy to make the decision. So that is the, for the OOD uh, data. So reliability in summary is that we should know when we can trust the model's prediction. Some of the, um, the reliability is kind of the critical in the real world applications. For example, like the safe driving car, if the safe driving car encounters some of the shadow, if the shadow is the kind of a stolen, so this car should tell the user driver, oh, I cannot make, I can, I don't know the, the this is the stolen or the, just the water. So you pretty, pretty, it will let a user to make a decision. However, if the, if the, uh, the, the, the car should say, oh, uh, it's, I'm very confident that is the. It, it, I'm very confident it is the just the water. So the, the car will just go through that one. Um, another case it would be like healthcare because the cost of the health healthcare some error would be very very high. So uh, this is the so more formally let's talk about the reliability. So we, we so this is called, this is for the in distribution. So we talk about that for the in distribution cases the reliability is can we should say. Uh, reliability that the, the confidence should match the accuracy. So reliability here is kind of the defined as the agreement between the accuracy and the confidence. So what does it mean? So there are some of the figures, it's called the reliability diagrams. So the figures, okay, there are two figures that are just the same, or uh, there, there, there are the, the figures for different cases. We can first look at one of them. Um, so the X is the confidence score, uh, confidence value, and the confidence value is, for example, like the logits, the after the soft max. So it's kind of range between zero and one. So higher means that the model is more confident. And the Y is the accuracy. So you can see there are some of the beans. There are some of the different interval. So each interval is the bean. So the bean that for, because for example, there are like many, many instances we need to make the prediction. For each in instance, the model will have the confidence value. So the the instance uh, the confidence value of the instance belonging to for example the between um, 0.2 and 0.3 we will calculate the average we calculate the average accuracy for all these instances so we will get the uh, the accuracy of y here for this bin so this the value is calculated this way so the value for this bin is the average accuracy is the accuracy of the instance whose confidence value belonging to 0 0.2 and 0 0.3. So similar for the other, the beans. So, so this is the, so ideally if the model is reliable, we should say, oh, the confidence, for example, the confidence is between the, the two and point 0.2 and point 0.3. Expectedly that the confidence, the accuracy should also belongs to the, the point 0.2 and point 0.3. So as the results, ideally a rel the, the, the diagram of the reliant model the, should be along the, this line. However, if the model is not reliable, there could be some gap. For example, here, for example, this, the blue line, the blue, the, for, the, for this being the blue line, the blue is, the, is lower. I mean, that's the ACC is, is maybe this, maybe it's just point, point 0.5, but the, but the, 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 the confidence value is 0.9. So the confidence value is much higher than the ACC. So it means that the model is overconfident, but so it's not reliable means that model. Okay, so, so this is the definition of the reliability. And so we, people um, in the, people in this, in this world, they propose the expected the ECE value to measure this kind of discrepancy. So basically the idea is that use the, the ACC uh, minors the confidence and we uh, accumulate all the values and uh, do some normalization. So this is the, it is kind of the discrepancy between the ACC and the confidence. So that is reliability. 
but more recently people propo uh, propose different uh, metrics to measure the reliability. Okay, uh, next is for the in distribution. Uh, for the out of, out of distribution cases, we, we will use the um, MSP. So the, the, the maximum soft max score. So the details will be ignored here. So we just need to know that we uh, use the MSP as measure to measure the reliability for the auto distribution. Uh, more specifically, we have the AUROC and, and FPR as the metric. So the AUROC is larger, it's better. The FPR lower is better. Okay, the reliability uncertainty uh, is uh, the, the, the challenge is that the, because the DM model, especially large scale AI models, usually overconfident. This is because for the large scale models, the URI can generate a very larger probability or larger the confidence, but the accuracy could be low. So th this means that the, 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 the model is overconfident about, overconfident about its decision. So the, the disadvantage that it will lead to the, the uncalibrated prediction in the, un, in the in distribution data, and it will also lead to the weak detection capacity on OOD data. So we will first focus on the, the ID data, the in distribution. Any question now? Yeah, Dong Kwa, I have mm -hmm. some questions. So, yes, uh, so can I go back to your previous slides? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so previous one? Oh, previous one? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This one, yeah. So, here, so in this figure, you mentioned that so for a properly trained model, uh, idea case that so. Uh, the its confidence and accuracy should kind of be consistent, right? And uh, yes. so I remember, so there's a very famous figures from the original adversarial attack paper. So when a model is under the adversarial attack and then so it have a kind of the incorrect uh, classification result, but with very high confidence. So do you believe mm -hmm. that? So this phenomenon is because the originally trained vulnerable model it is kind of has kind of a low reliability and if we improve the, the reliability during the training process and then so its robustness and such like the adversary attack will also be improved yes uh thank you uh dr dr Yan. i think yeah so i are uh, uh, so your question is that for uh, for some of the adversary training the the pattern could be uh, like the the right one so the ACC, the confidence is higher, but the ACC is lower. So, so uh, yes, so it could be that the reason is that the model, so it, it indicates that the model is overconfident about its, it's overconfident about its prediction. So if you, pro, if you try to improve the, uh, if, if you try to improve, for example, use, use the ECE as the object function, as the loss, you can improve the adversary, uh, you can improve the overall performance, that could be. But I should say the, the lower ACC could uh, could not only be uh, due to the the reliability issue. I mean, the it could be uh, improve, uh, improved by the ECE ECE loss, but it could be uh, optimized by other aspects. So in the uh, in the so I will I will share you the, the slide after after talk. So in the two uh, and two and two thousand twenty one, there there is a paper uh, a study uh, the 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 co the co in, in, and the the relation between the robustness and the reliability so that paper study do some exploration for that one but i should say this is kind of very uh, very early stage for for this for this topic for the uh, the robustness the relationship between robustness and the reliability okay thank you yeah i, I think so it, this is a very interesting the kind of the relationship relationship between these very two important uh, metrics yeah yeah. And another question, quick question that so, so here when we talk about like the, the um, performance is like the accuracy and so on. So that is, I assume that so we imply that this is for the classification task, right? Mm -hmm. Now how about for yeah. some other tasks like the regression? So then how we can measure its reliability? Oh, this is a great question. So, um, so beyond the regression task, I should say, for example, like the generation task, so, um, so for the generate for the generation task, the goal is to generate, for example, like ChatGPT, you will generate a multiple the new sentence, and, and so measure the reliability of for the generate for the generation task is quite challenging. I don't think there is some existing efforts um, very well known in this in this area because there is no label. So the key question is that how to define the how to define the reliability for the 
uh, for the task without label. So this is kind of challenging. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. So if there is no other question, I will continue my uh, part. Uh, I will try to speed up to save the time. Um, so calibration, I first about our one, uh, first work on the uh, calibration or the how to generate the reliable model for the uh, in-distribution data. I should say the 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 two works, the two efforts are from my co-advice students, um, uh, Bowen, and he's very um, amazing. So I uh, very appreciate his efforts. Um, so uh, the conclusion is that the sparse training, uh, as the title said, the sparse training is not unreliable on in distribution data. So our work, uh, our efforts provide the first study on the reliability of a sparse training. Um, so let's see the uh, don't uh, you can don't you, can, you don't need to see the figure first, but you can first uh, see the conclusion. The conclusion is that the sparse model, including the ninety uh, ninety five percent or maybe higher, even higher, a more over a more over confident over confident than the dense model. What does it mean? So then mean that for the large scale AI model, so they already overconfident about its prediction because the its model too big and because the optimization is can go into some of the local optimal. But I should say, we should say, we can say that for the sparse model, the overconfidence issue is exaggerated, is, is, is bigger, is more uh, severe. So that is the one conclusion. Uh, uh, another interesting uh, thing we found that, we found that there could, you know, when we increase, so you can see on the most right figure, the X is the sparsity, and from the right to the left, the sparsity is increasing. And the Y is the ECE value. And we can see the, the ECE value in the blue line. You can see uh, when we increase the sparsity, we found that the ECE value first goes up, then goes down. Let, finally, the well goes up. This is a double descent. So this is can, um, so this is the, um, so because we found a double descent uh, and the, the pattern in the, in the loss, uh, in terms of loss metric. Uh, here, we found that the double descent in the ECE value. So this, uh, this is kind of interesting uh, finding. It will help people to design. So when you when you design some of the sparse model in um, to meet the different requirements in terms of sparsity, uh, and when you uh, if your model lies in different range of this sparsity, you will consider the difference the the reliability issue. So some of it will be um, increasing. The issue will be bigger. The issue will be smaller. So that is the meaning. That is the the meaning of the double descent. So in summary, our work found that our work is the we we study the reliability of the sparse training, and then we found that sparse model will exact exaggerates the the overconfident issue compared to the dense model. Okay. So in in principle, what is our goal? So in principle, our goal is that we want to achieve some of the trade off. Um, between the, the reliability and the sparsity. The sparsity is kind of the space efficiency. So in this figure, the X is the space efficiency. So um, the Y is the reliability. So uh, generally speaking, if the sparsity is lower than 95%, uh, we will see this kind of pattern. So uh, our goal is to, um, maybe this is the ideal goal, is to is too aggressive, but we want to achieve a good trade-off between the reliability and the space efficiency. So the space efficiency means that we will it will have lower requirements for the memory, and the reliability means that we will it's more the behavior will be more consistent in the real world. And before I go to some of the, uh, the uh, technique, I, I want to first answer your question. Oh, so you say that the sparse model is not is not reliable? Why? So the diff, the the chat the, the reason is that the the sparse model. During, in the sparse model, the optimization will the it will cut off the updating roots in optimization. So generally speaking, because the model is sparse, some of the neuron or some of the collections are removed. So the the gradients will not be passed in a smooth way and during the BP process. So that is the main reason. So let me give you uh, this the, on the right figure. This is the illustration uh, why the sparse will. Uh, is more and have more challenging for the optimization. So this figure, um, uh, th there is the, uh, this figure, the, the Y is the training loss. So the X are some of the, you can consider the X are some of the different location of the future space of the model space. So the, 
the this one the zero uh, this one there is the uh, so each each dot of the line in the checkpoints uh, the checkpoint means that the difference the difference location of the model space or the future space so so for this for the, for the for the zero location this one because the training loss is is the lowest one so we would prefer and uh, we would prefer our optimized final model should be like in this position the zero but however we could start we could start from the suppose that we start from the position one okay and um, there are different lines for example like the like the like, like this this line like this line uh, how to say the the color this is this color this this is the dense model so from for the dense model you can see from one to the zero it is kind of smooth because the collection the neuron they are not sparse they are all full size However, if we introduce some sparsity, for example, different sparsity, the Bezer uh, one, three, the Bezer two, or linear sparse, you can see the trajectory of the, so the trajectory, they are changed. So for the linear sparse, which is the most sharp or steep, you can see if we want to, for the linear sparse, if we want to move from zero, the one to the zero, oh, we need to, it's very challenging. We need to first go up, then down, down, down. Oh, this is kind of maybe maybe sometimes it's impossible compared to the the dense model. So this means that why the sparse model is more unreliable. This mainly due to the 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 sparsity. That's the optimization is not smooth during the the BB process. Okay, so um, so we know that we want to generate the sparse model. How do we do this? So we propose the sparse training model with the two sparse masks. So typically, uh, when we uh, talk about the sparse uh, training, we will use this one mask is the determined mask, determinist mask. But we use two masks, determinist mask and random mask. So this is the uh, this is the typical one. So the M mask is kind of a typical mask. You will use the M mask to control the whole the overall topology of your sparse model. Uh, that's the typical one. So. Um, for example, if we want to have the 90% of sparsity, so M will have 90% of its elements as zero. So this is the typical mask. But however, we will we propose use additional one Z and as the round the mask. So so uh, remember one question from the audience, and he talked about the re reinforced learning. So one thing, a critical thing about reinforced learning is the exploration. So we actually here you can consider the Z the random mask as the as approach to do the exploration. So random mask uh, is the main goal, should I say. So this is the W, W is the original weights. We will first uh, element-wise by the, the, the deterministic mask, then you will, we will apply the, the random mask, finally we will get the, the sparse uh, weight matrix. The random mask uh, have two benefits. Uh, one, the main benefit is that it will helps, it will helps it will help explore the width space because um, it allows some the exploration. Maybe the exploration is good, maybe bad, but if we um, you, if we keep the exploration, we finally can find a better find a better mask. So uh, more specifically, uh, we will randomly sample the the mask from the Bernoulli and distribution, and so we will draw. So it, the, this this figure, this flow, uh, show the general idea. We we'll draw the we will draw the the random mask and then select the non-zero weights to the de deactive. The model will explore other directions and more randomness and better exploration. So that's the general idea. Mm, more details, but I think it's maybe too uh, technical. So here, so we use the uh, our goal. Uh, our goal is that we we want to generate W uh, the sparse W. We apply the the M. There is a determinist mask and the Z is the random mask. So how do we do this? The procedure is that uh, we will first only train the W plus M um, during the first 80% of the tra whole training um, pipeline. But after the left 20% of training pipeline, we will add the Z into the, the updating process. So in this way, for example, here you can see uh, during the last training stage, I mean, like the 20% the of the whole training, uh, whole training pipeline, we will collect the, the WI, the M, the ZI, the W2, M, the Z2, and the WK and ZK. So uh, they, are the, they, are the, uh, the, the, they are in the same direction, they are in the direction of the, the time. 
So the 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 w, the two is the after one the k is after the k k minus one. So finally, when we so when we get these checkpoints, we will do an average weight average. We will average we will average the 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 all of them. So for each, so this is the mask. This is mask. We will average all. We will. So here we have a k the the checkpoint sparse checkpoints. We will do the the weight average to do to generate the final sparse model. So that's the the whole procedure. Uh, the benefit about this procedure of, or our proposed one is that we only need we only need to store one model. And do one for work during testing. So recently, if you are um, for me, if you are familiar with the efficient training, so recent work is called the model soup. So model soup shared the same idea. Uh, we share the same idea with model soup. We only keep the, the the one model checkpoint and do the one for what do one for work during testing. Another benefit is that it will uh, our, this kind of design will lead to more better model. I don't want to use the better usually. I don't uh, because the better it's hard to it will be have different different definitions by different people. So I should say it will lead to more comprehensive model. So for example, so we have one maybe one checkpoint here. Oh, this is the is the loss or the error landscape. So maybe this is one checkpoint. This is one checkpoint, and this is another checkpoint. If we can do the average between all of them. We we probably can get the uh, optimal line in the middle. So in the middle, the the lower is uh, smaller. So the blue is higher, the the yellow is lower. So that is the general idea about the weight averaging. Uh, I think it's the very uh, the very popular used one to the weight average or example learning is to use to improve the efficiency or improve the robustness technique. So that's the general idea. Uh, we also have some of the, we will also provide some of the theoretical justification, but I just want to ignore it here. So if you are interested, uh, you, you can check it in our paper. The general idea, we design some of the, we we design a hierarchical Bayesian ap approximation to to for for our for for the for the for the for the mask Z. And so the 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 benefits of the hierarchical design that uh, the hierarchical allows a, a larger family of distribution which can. Which can cover more the the uh, larger future space, and also uh, our hierarchical design can um, more accurately uh, measure the relationship between the weights and the mask. That's the general idea. Let's see some of the experiments. So um, we compare our method with Rigo. Uh, Rigo is one uh, tip, a very uh, well known the sparse training method. So uh, for the for the top three figures, uh, the x is the different uh, sparsity, the y is the ECC value indicating the reliability. So we found that our method Seagull uh, is the red one and the Rigo is the blue one. We found that under the different we we do the experiments under different architecture under different the on different data sets and on different uh, sparsity. So we always consistently found that our methods always show better performance, better reliability compared to the recall. And uh, as we said, we care about the reliability, reliability but we, we don't want to see some of the, the performance drop in terms of the accuracy. So we also provide this table. The table mirrors the predictive performance in terms of the ACC on the CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100. We can see, our, uh, under different sparsity, uh, our method SQL uh, always achieve a higher performance. And so that is the experiment results. Um, so I just, uh, this is a comparison between with some of the dropout methods because the hierarchical Bayesian methods, uh, we is motivated by the dropout methods, but I just got the here, uh, just uh, skip the here. Uh, this is another interesting finding. So we also, because we, sh we should say that we uh, we our method is better than than Rico, but Rico is not a, a specifically designed a calibration method for sparse training. So in order to make the comparison more fair, we we compare our method with some of the calibration existing calibration methods, for example, like the mix up, like the temperature scaling. So for example, like the mix up here in the first figure, uh, our uh, so the circle and um, uh, different so. Uh, this uh, different location of the circle indicates different uh, sparsity, and the different circle uh, indicates the different ECE value reliability. Uh, we can find that uh, our method is in the, the the red area, and the blue line, the area is the best line. Uh, the mix up, we can always find under different sparsity, our method is always the area is lower than the 
the blue, the red area is low, is smaller than the red, the blue area. So this means that our methods uh, is better than the mix up calibration methods. Similarly, we do we compare our method with temperature scaling with the level smoothing. So the red area is always smaller than the blue area. So uh, def, um, indicating the benefits of our method. So I just skip the the other parts. So some takeaways. So our uh, we propose the sparse training, and we found that sparse training uh, exacerbates the the over overconfident problem. And uh, we propose some the we propose the double mask design and the weight averaging to enable to enable the reliable sparse training. And empirically and, imp and theoretically, we show the improved reliability. So maybe I maybe have only like the less than 10 minutes, I will do it very quickly. So last part, I will um, tell you, uh, show the our efforts on the detection on OOD. So this is because um, in the real world, we the OOD data could be more hap could happen more than the ND data, uh, data sets because for like the ImageNet or the CIFAR 100, you, the data sets already pre-processed, but in the real world, it's hard to say, you, 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 it's hard to say what you will encounter in the future. So all the data we need to cover. So it's the same case that uh, we, for the for the ID data, we already designed a calibrated prediction on ID data. So that question is that's the OOD. So we'll focus on the OOD. Um, the conclusion is that um, the sparse model are unreliable on OOD as well. So we've provided the first study on the reliability on the OOD for the sparse training. This figure shows the motivation for our research. So the, the, the figure is very interesting. You can see the X is the in, in the reliability. The, the Y is the OOD reliability in terms of the AUROC. We can see this is a dense model. So we uh, the lower the the in the reliability is lower is better. And but for the AUROC, higher is better. So more in the top right, in the top left. Is preferred top left is preferred, so we found that all existing methods they will lie in the very the the bottom the right bottom, and another thing that we found that um, based on the in D we found that the uh, there could, so for, for the for the in D for the for the in D the we found the larger the ECE value and for the for the uh, for the AUROC we found that the it, they're kind of smaller so. The conclusion is that the sparse training and does not do a good job on both the ID and OOD. And we can even some found you know, when the sparsity is increasing, like the 95% compared to the 80 or 90, the, the issue is more severe. So because the uh, the the Y value is lower and the the reliability is more same, maybe yes, the it means that's the um, the, the, this is kind of future uh, future topic. That's the uh, the the higher sparsity will does higher sparsity have more severe issue in terms of the OOD or ID. So, but we we demonstrate that for the sparse for a sparse model, uh, it will have issue on both ID and OOD. So uh, the the reason so our goal is that we don't want to um, we don't want to put more efforts like the additional training cost or the addition using additional the, the OOD data to achieve the uh, a reliable uh, reliability OOD data because currently you can use more you can use more data you you can use more OOD data and to make sure your model are reliable on OOD but we don't want to do that because the OOD data may be not um, easy to collect or maybe it's hard to the cost may be high. So we our goal is that we want to make our model reliable on OOD even without some additional training cost without additional OOD data. So, so this uh, the current existing research on the this part is that uh, people will we you, we will design people will design the K class and we output the K uh, output K dimension the P one P K. But but. But this the current the current flow or the current design they cannot handle they cannot handle the unknown or the OOD data which never seen before in the training set. So we propose it's very simple. So we propose to add an extra dimension, the the PK plus one. So we design uh, we we design we use the extra dimension. We want to use this extra dimension to store some unknown information. So if the the extra dimension is larger, the value is larger. Uh, we should say the model maybe doesn't know the sample. 
if the the x dimension is lower and the model we should say in the model is is it knows the sample uh, according to our experiments we found uh, the results mm, the results verify our assumption that if the if we test our model on the on the OOD data uh, on the in, on the ND data we found that the the extra pk uh, the extra dimension is lower if we test our model on some of the OOD data we found that it's larger so more specifically, we design this kind of loss. We call this loss is the unknown aware loss. So we encourage the, the principle that we encourage the model to be aware of now of unknown. So we, we aim to learn good PK, PK minor PK plus one. So the principle is that if the prediction is correct, so we will just use a typical cross entropy loss as the as the object function to minimize the to mean to opt to update the model. If the prediction is incorrect, so we found oh sometimes we did we didn't do a good uh, prediction performance, so we assume that maybe it will encounter some of the OOD data. So in this way, we will revise the loss. We will add a larger weight before the log p p y i. So this kind of weight, larger weight, so we'll emphasize on the unknown information. So this is the the principle. So in summary. So if we found the prediction is good, so we'll just use the, uh, the typical uh, the cross entropy loss. If we found the prediction is not good, we add the larger weights to emphasize the unknown information. So we will we'll push the information, we'll push the model to learn more information on the extra dimension. So that's the general principle. Okay. Um, so um, one thing is kind of uh, so the reason why the model will do a good a bad thing on the OOD is because the optimization and the, the, the optimization route is cut off um, due to the sparsity constraint. So the cut off because the sparsity cut off the uh, update routes. Um, one thing that so people say, oh, okay, so we know that's the OOD for the OOD and for the OOD data, the, the reliability is kind of issue. Can we apply the strategy designed for the ND data? Exactly apply that of strategy for the OOD data? No, the answer is no. We cannot do that. So th this is because um, intuitively, this is because uh, this is mainly due to the sparsity constraint. If we directly use the strategy for the ID data, so it means that we will allow the model to do some bad prediction during the first, during the beginning stage, but if we allow the model doing some of the um, the behavior or some of the errors, we will, some of the failures in during the beginning stage, it will make the the case more worth after the for the final stage. So it means that for the the main the the conclusion is that we can because of the sparse training, if we directly apply the in the uh, in the training strategy, the the strategy for the in the data. It will the model will make more mistakes in the early stage. And this will so in this way, well, we will emphasize on the unknown in the early stage. So because so as a result, we don't want the model to do some more mistakes in the early stage. So how do we do this? So this is the just the conclusion. So uh, this means that we don't want the model, the sparse model, to do um, mistake to uh, to do more mistakes in the in the beginning stage. So uh, as a result, we did de we designed this kind of the the W auto training scheduler. The W auto train this is the this is the this is the design for the um, our our proposed loss. You can see there is the W. The W is the hyperparameter, and the PK plus one is the additional uh, uh, dimension. So the W is kind of critical. So we design a scheduler which can automatically de determine the W's value. Uh, for the whole sparse training, the, the pipeline. The general, the principle is that during the early stage, the W will be zero. It means that during the early stage, the, the, the our sparse training method is just like a typical one. But the thing is different happens uh, for, the, for the later stage. We will gradually increase W to tell model the unknown information step by step after the early stage. So the early stage we just used, we, we designed, we, 
you can, uh, in our efforts, we designed early stage at the 80% of the whole training pipeline, but you can have the difference, the, the, the def definition of the early stage. It will depends on your, the, the it depends on the, the data sets. It will also depends on the, uh, the task. So general idea is that we will um, set the zero. You can see if we set the W to be zero, so it's just the typical, the cross entropy. If we in, gradually increase W, so you will pay more attention to the P, um, min, P plus one. So that means that we will emphasize more on the extra dimension. So let the model to know more information step by step. So that's the principle of, design, of, the, of the loss design. Um, by the way, so the last, uh, last uh, the, another trick we used for the, for the, for the, for our method is the voting is similar as the weight of average. So we combine the, we will save the multiple checkpoints um, during the, uh, after the latest early stage. So we, for example, after, uh, during the, during the last 20% of the training pipeline, we will save multiple checkpoints and uh, do the weight average of all of them. So uh, this way we can have more, we can get a more comprehensive sense of the future space. So in this way, we can get the lower error. So that is the general idea of the width average. Uh, this, we also provide some of the theoretical insights uh, for our uh, effort for this work. Um, so the details just skipped here. You can find the more details in our paper. The general idea is that uh, we found that, we found that the, for the DM model, uh, there could be the re, uh, unreliability it mean that we we prove that this the first turn is the confidence the second turn is the is the the ACC we prove that for the sparse training the difference between the ex expectation of the confidence and the expectation of the ACC is there is the minimal uh, there is the overbound and after uh, after applying our method we prove that the uh, we can we can we can we can we can we can guarantee that the the difference between the the expectation of the confidence and the expectation of the ACC will be bounded by will be bounded by the uh will, will be bounded so that is the general idea of our the the theoretical insights and more details you can check in our paper okay let's see some very briefly see some readouts and so this also we compare we first compare to the regal and so the regal you can see and there are figures, the X is the sparsity, different sparsity, the Y is the ECE value. Um, so we can see, because, because our method cannot only achieve the, the good performance on OOD, we can also achieve the good performance on ND. So we also compare the ECE value. So you can see our method, moon, when we call it moon, and it's the red, the red line is always lower than the, the blue line, the first two figure. For the test accuracy, we can achieve a little higher and um, performance, the ACC than the, than the regal. Uh, we also compare with some of the OOD detection methods because we uh, we, um, we we focus on the OOD. So we can see um, in terms of the AUROC, uh, higher is better. Uh, our method, Muon, um, the is higher than the MSP. The MSP is the is the post-processing method for the OOD detection. Um, so we also compare with other OOD detection, detection the OOD, IN, and EBO. So we found that uh, in terms of the AUROC, uh, we our method is higher. For example, here, but for some uh, the, for the FPR, uh, we are we are lower, and so our method is better. Yeah, details. I just I, I just give the details here. And uh, this is uh, we compare. We also uh, change the the training the sparse training backbone. We use the SET compare ST. We also uh, show the perform compare the performance on the ND data and the OD data. Uh, this is the calibration uh, readouts compared to the other calibration methods. And uh, this is the temperature scaling, the mix up. So similar as the previous one. And um, we also do some ablation study to demonstrate, to verify the effectiveness of the different components of our methods. And the other ablation study for the OOD. Let's just skip here. So three takeaways. So this work uh, study the reliability on both the ID and the OOD data. So we found that the existing sparse models, they are lots, they are lots reliable on both of them. And in order to enable the reliability, uh, we propose the, uh, we propose the unknown wear loss and uh, combined with the weight averaging um, approach. And lastly, we um, theoretically and uh, empirically, we proved there could be the error, the difference between the, the 
the, the difference between the confidence and the ACC could be bounded by our methods. Mm, thank you uh, for your time. The, the, I think that's the everything I want to present for today's talk. Thank you. Thank you, Donghui. Thank you for a very interesting and inspiring talk. And, um, Thank you so much. Questions from the audience? You can input your question in the chat box or you can directly unmute yourself. Hello? Hello, Donghui. Hi, yeah. Hi, Miao. I, I think my, my camera is inversed. Yes. It's weird. Okay, I'll, I'll stop my camera. So I have a quick question uh, for your um, first paper, the mm -hmm. in-distribution uh, reliability. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, uh, you, you kind of do two masks. The one is the, uh, is the regular masks uh, based on the uh, based on criteria and the Z is the random mask. Yes. So I was curious um, if we remove the uh, M, just do random mask. Uh, did you do that uh, ablation study? Yes, we do. So you can see on this slide uh, 33, we do the ablation study by removing the random mask and the width, the average, the width average mask. Uh, we, uh, so for example, here, uh, the, the blue one is the, uh, the the red one is ours, and we can find that um, our so without the two components, uh, our method cannot achieve that high performance. Okay. So the red one. The the red the red one is ours. The seagull, for example, like ECE value here, the WMA, and so. The red one is ours, so you can see the seagull. So this is the, the Y is the ECE value. The lower is better. So our red one is lower than the than the our method without M, with er, the width averaging. The 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 green one is the is the width averaging. You can see without the width averaging, you can see there is the very high the uncertainty um, compared to our uh, method. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank no you problem. for your excellent presentation. No problem, yeah. Feel happy to dis have more discussion with you uh, offline. Yeah, sure, sure. Other questions from the audience? If no more questions from the audience, actually, so I have several questions for you. So, so following uh, Miao's question, so here you use the two mask, uh, uh, deterministic mask and a random mask. So I was wondering, so the motivation of use to introduce additional random mask things like in many sparse training work. So when we want to introduce a deterministic mask, a actually, so it's to still be involved with some of the sampling operations there. So actually we already introduced some of the randomness there. So what is kind of the underlying motivation we still need to use some of the random mask there? Oh, this is a good question. So uh, this is a really good question. Your question is that why would uh, do, so we already use, have the mask, why do we use another mask? So um, so uh, the first, in, in terms of in, intuition, so when we, when we were, when we were, when we were uh, doing this project, uh, we want to, um, I would say, uh, clearly, uh, the uh, isolated the the some the uh, exper we want to so we want to divide the inference we want to because the mask we assume that the mask can have some the exploration and the interpret so you can see so I should say in this way so um, the original motivation when we designed the two masks the double mask is that we want to um, isolate it or uh, quantify the difference inference from of from the mask. So we want to use one mask to indicate in one inference and another mask in indicating one. So for the for the random mask, we just want to use the random mask to indicate the, the exploration of a property. So we want to use the, the determinist mask to as generally as the exploit, exploitation on the of property. And that is the motivation. So we want to distinguish the the distinguish it, the, the, the inference. 
And for the, according to the experiments, we found that uh, when we have this kind of double mask design, we can capture the the correlation between the weights and the the mask bet the, the the mask better. So that's the uh, I think that's the main reason. But there could be a more advantages, but there could be some of the disadvantages. Yeah. Thank you. And now some other question about the results parts, and uh, it, it looks like so your method can be applied to the different uh, uh, spa training backbone techniques, right? Like the, the SET and the rig L and so on. So yeah. uh, do you have some further experiments that to be apply some more recent sparse training methods? Because like the rig L is the work in the, I remember it's 2019 or the 2020 and so on. Mm. So recently we, some more advanced um, unstructured sparse training method that can achieve very high accuracy and so on. Oh, so whether your approach can also be applied to them. And also, because here your results is mainly on the CIFA 10 and CIFA 100. So how about the performance on the like image and ad? Yeah, thank you for your question. So first one, now we didn't try very, very recent, the most sought out methods. We tried the recall and the sets because they are typical ones. And so um, for we, we did try the image that I think we include some of the efforts, uh, some of the results in the paper, but we found that the uh, the improvement maybe not that much in significant. And another issue, but the another issue is that where the, the the cost will be very extremely high for the image net. So so we mainly talk about the the CFR one hundred or yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And, and thank any you. other so, questions from our audience? Yeah. And also, please feel free to send emails if you if you have any questions from the audience. Okay, so if no more questions for audience, so let's thank our speaker again. So Songkran, thank you so much. This is a really a very interesting and uh, inspiring talk. And, uh, it's my honor to be thank, here. And also thank everyone to attend our today's seminar. So see you guys next Thursday. Okay. Thank, thank you, Songkran. Have everyone. a wonderful day. Bye. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye everyone.